Hello, welcome to the very first episode of Burning Questions. This is going to be our talking discussion uh, to allow our viewers to hear some important questions that they might have, but everyone else probably does have in the industry. And here at Quellfire, uh, we often say we're not just about the products that you can see behind us. We like to feel that we are a part of the bigger industry of the passive fire protection. And we want to talk about these things. We don't like to have the uh, elephants in the room. Let's talk about it. Let's have a discussion and let's you know, get to these burning questions, as we say. But who said that learning can't be fun? Um, we've developed a format which not only allows us to discuss and cover these important topics, but also have a bit of a competition, which will hopefully burn the answers of, to these questions and topics into your memory. So first of all, we thought we'd just do an introduction of uh, myself and uh, Glenn, just so you know who we are, just in case you haven't looked at our website or anything like that, or watched any of our other videos. So my name is Alec, I'm a member of the technical team at Quell Fire. So I do a lot of um, daily business with our fire stoppers or designers, where they all send a lot of these questions that we're going to uh, be discussing in today. And I'm Glenn, also a member of the, the Quell Fire team. I work more in the sales side of things. Um, dealing with customers on a day-to-day -day basis, helping with simple technical queries um, and assisting in other areas such as training. So uh, now you know where we're both from. Like I said, mine more from the technical side, Glenn's more from the sales side. So we see um, the questions from both sides of the, uh, the will, so to speak. The topic of today's uh, episode uh, is going to be around fire science. Uh, the reason why we're going to cover this one is it's a very generic term. It covers a lot of different things. and It is sometimes quite important to understand where we're coming from when we're talking to you because there is a sort of science behind it. Now, fire science can cover things such as the fire triangle, uh, how fires develop, uh, fire resistance, reaction to fire, how materials and uh, products behave, that type of thing. So it is a very broad term. So we're just going to be asking each other some questions around this. So because I'm the oldest and also the beautiful and the saying is, you know, age before beauty, I went on both counts. I'm going to ask the first question for today. So, Glenn, the first question of burning questions. When we're talking about a fire developing in a room such as a building, so if you imagine we're in a, the room now, what are the stages of fire development? Yeah, so typically fire is broken down into different areas. Um, as far as I believe, the first one, the first stage is ignition, then growth, then flash over, um, then the fire is fully developed, and then you have decay. Yep, that's correct. Uh, well done. So Glenn gets the first point there. So yeah, the, typically when we're talking about a fire within a building, uh, in a room or a compartment, there will be uh, five initial stages that are agreed upon. The first one being ignition. Uh, for some of you out there, you might also know this is incipient. Um, this is where you'll have something, if you imagine a cigarette butt landing on the couch that I'm sat on now, there will be fuel, there'll be oxygen, and there'll be heat, that enough that will make a chemical reaction that will start a combustion. Then, usually, especially if it's on a couch that I'm sat on now, it will start to go into the growth stage, and this is where the fire will look for combustible materials to start developing. What happens then is usually you'll start to get a smoke layer in the room, and this is trapped within the four walls and it will start to radiate heat. The heat will start to start gradually and very quickly increasing in the room. The uh, combustible materials around this will actually start to emit a gas that's uh, flammable. And when that gas reaches the, the uh, smoke layer and the temperature rises enough, there will be a sudden flashover, as we call it. And that's when the whole room then becomes engulfed in flames. And this is where the fully developed fire comes into play. Now this is very important for me and Glenn because our products, this is what our products are trying to stop. So when this fire is at its fully developed stage, that's when the whole room is in fire. We're trying to stop that fully developed fire from escaping into other compartments. Hopefully our products do the job, the fire brigade gets there in enough time for the fire rating, etc. And they start to put it out. And this is when you get the last stage that Glenn mentioned, which is decay. And that's when the fire starts to die down. But you have to be careful because a sudden influx of oxygen or fuel, you know, some more combustible materials can start the process over again. So Glenn, what is your question for me? So when we refer to fires in buildings, what does the term fire resistance mean? It's a good question. Uh, something definitely misunderstood in the industry. Um, so generally when we're talking about fire resistance, it is the overarching term uh, describe a building or its components that will um, satisfy a required period of time of preventing the fire from going into another compartment. So 
your the time so for example you're very often here 30 minutes 60 minutes a two hour fire rating that's the specified time that the fire is stopped from getting from one compartment to another generally it's broken down into three primary um, categories uh, but there are other ones as well out there before i get berated in the comments so the first one is load bearing which is usually represented by the letter r you then have this second one, which is integrity, that's uh, represented by the letter E. And then the last one is insulation, that's uh, represented by the uh, letter I, but more often than not, you'll see EI because you don't normally have it without integrity as well. So what each of the, one of those mean, uh, very briefly, um, <coughs> load bearing, that's just the uh, time, the, the floor or the wall will support um, itself and the weight whilst it's under fire conditions, because there are uh, factors that will affect things. Steel, for example, if that's not protected correctly, once it reaches a certain temperature, approximately about 550 degrees, it does start to lose its structural performance, about 50% generally as well. There's considerations with concrete, and if you have timber, there's charring factors like that as well. When we're talking about integrity, uh, basically what this means is the time it takes from the fire in the fire side to get through any gaps uh, or holes through um, to the non-fire side. Uh, very briefly on that, when it comes to insulation, which is a factor that many people forget about, that's the time it takes the heat from the fire side to transfer through uh, to the non-fire side. Uh, typically, this is about 180 degrees <coughs> above uh, the room temperature when we're doing the, uh, the tests and stuff like that for it as well. But that's generally what fire resistance means. Bang on, very good answer. Yeah, so Quellfire's primary focus is service penetrations. Um, so when we're fire testing for service penetrations, we generally are only concerned with the integrity and insulation ratings, not the, the load bearing that Alec referred to, so EI. So a service penetrations performance um, when it comes to integrity and insulation um, can differ and <clears throat> get different results, which is why it's vital when our customers are looking at solutions, they understand what their fire resistance requirement is generally the fire strategy of the project. So, for example, an uninsulated copper pipe, you can see the board behind me, um, is un unlikely on its own to achieve an EI rating, integrity and insulation, um, only an E rating, integrity. Um, the transfer of heat through a copper pipe is, is very great. Um, but add some local interrupted rock fiber insulation, as you can see, um, and you can achieve an EI rating. So it's these little differences in the detail that can greatly change the, the outcome and the results. So are you ready for question two? Absolutely. As you asked me about fire resistance, uh, why don't you explain then what reaction to fire means in the buildings? Okay, yeah, so reaction to fire is not typically an area that Quellfire are um, concerned about particularly. Um, reaction to fire concerns the behaviour of materials um, lining the walls and ceilings of a room, um, so to encourage growth, the growth of a fire um, to a stage where, as you spoke about before, the flashover occurs. Um, consequently, reaction to fire is measured in terms of a material's um, propensity to ignite, um, surface spread of flame, um, release heat, yeah. um, be combustible to any extent. Um, so you mentioned the couches, materials like that, um, and uh, flame droplets as well. So where a product might melt and produce flame droplets. Um, so reaction to fire may be considered as the degree to which a material is um, used within the building um, and how it might contribute to the growth of a fire. Um, <clears throat> and as opposed to fire resistance, which you mentioned before, um, the sp spread of fire from one compartment to another. So is that is that is that correct? Yeah, no, I, I thought I'd catch you up there, to be honest, because <laughs> it's not something, as Glenn said, it's not something that we predominantly cover here at Quellfire. Uh, our main focus is fire resistance. Um, you know, stopping that fully developed fire. So yeah, Glenn was correct. When it comes to reaction to fire, they're very small scale tests and they're usually just about how materials uh, react in a fire, hence the name. Um, typically, you know, you might be, for some of our older viewers, very used to the UK forms like class O, uh, but predominantly you should be seeing more of the Euro class stuff like A1, A2, that means non-combustible, there's different levels there. Um, Back to the fire stages, the very first question that was asked, 
reaction to fire is very focused on the ignition and the growth, like Glenn, Glenn said, it's about the growth. Once it gets past that, that's where it comes into fire resistance and that's where quail fire comes into play. So Alec, time for your second question. Can you explain to me the difference between a fire test report and a classification report? Well, I hope so, because if I couldn't, I don't think I'd be working here, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, again a very good question. I think it's very important for our audience to know this. So there is a significant difference between the two. Um, again, very confused in the industry. So if we describe what a fire test report is generally first, so again, this is just, just um, basic, is it's typically the information of a test that you carried out on that day. So it's a snapshot of time, okay? Um, and it's, you know, tested to the rules of the specific test standard. So for us, we test to the service penetration standard uh, for that. <clears throat> and then usually what you get is what you get on the day. Um, where the classification report comes in is we test um, to the standard I just mentioned, and there are certain rules uh, set out that have been predetermined to allow a field or scope of application. So the accredited test laboratory that will take all our test reports, um, take them away, and they will put them in, into a classification report, which will provide the full scope. This is where you'll get the classification rate and the EI rating that we talked about earlier. Uh, this is where you'll get sort of the sizes of pipes or cables covered, the wall thicknesses, those typical type of rules. So it's a much more in depth document. And for those out there that are designing buildings or you're a fire stopper, it's actually the classification report or the ETA or UKTA, those documents that you wanna be referring to more than fire test reports. So I get constantly asked, can I have the test report for this? Yeah, you don't need that um, sort of side of things. So hopefully that answers it yeah. a little bit. <laughs> so. Correct, bang on, yeah, the score is neck and neck now, two all. Um, so yeah, like our quail stop fireback, for example, um, it's fire tested with multiple different quail fire products, um, yeah, loads of different closure devices and so on um, in different applications, walls, floors, loads of different substrate types. Um, so yeah, we've got huge amount, numbers of test reports for yeah, that, that one product alone. Um, then, as you mentioned, all those test reports for that single product get reviewed um, and then combined into one document to show all the applications um, that are covered from the fire test evidence, yeah. the test reports, um, and then the, the agreed upon extended scope of application. Um, so thicker walls, for example, yeah, um, like what we test thinner walls covers thicker walls. So. So Glenn, you ready for your final question of today's episode? Definitely. Do you reckon you can get top marks? I would hope so, yeah. Well, let's see. So my question for you is, is what is the difference between a standard fire test compared to an ad hoc fire test? Okay, yeah. So a um, standard fire test, the results are subject to um, a full report in accordance with the standard. Um, the report will be comprehensive, have a lot of detail in there on uh, full details of the supporting construction, um, the services and the test specimen testing process and so on. Um, whereas an ad hoc fire test, um, which has been performed to a non-standard procedure, um, so in the absence of a standardised process, um, <clears throat> but it utilises the principles of fire resistance testing um, and given the most relevant test methods, so service penetrations, um, and unlike standard fire tests which can then be classified and given the full extended scope um, ad hoc tests are generally um, they only cover what you test on the day um, so you don't get that extended scope so so on site for example unless your supporting construction and everything about the detail is, is exactly what we've tested um, then the the ad hoc test data um, won't be valid obviously unless the, the site conditions are less onerous than yeah. it could be considered. So yeah, what Glenn says is absolutely correct. And again, is something that for our viewers might be uh, not aware of. Um, so if we take, for example, plasterboard ceilings, straight away everyone's out there, very common. They are common, uh, probably built everywhere on some of your projects that you're uh, doing right now. But for service penetrations through uh, plasterboard ceilings, there isn't a test standard. There isn't a scope of application within the, the test standard that we can follow. Uh, so at Qualify, we have done some testing on plasterboard on timber joists. 
uh, but we followed the general principles of the BSEN 1366 Part 3 test standard to the best of our ability because we believe that something is better than nothing and it allow fire engineers to look. But because it's an ad hoc detail, this is where you'll get a fire test report rather than a classification report that we mentioned earlier. Um, and they'll, they'll be able to look at that, check that your application is equal or less onerous than what we've uh, tested and they'll be able to make a decision or they can use that primary uh, evidence for other means. So Alec, are you ready for your third and final question? Bring it on. Um, could you explain to me what a technical assessment is and the rules or guide that should be followed? Okay, yeah, yeah, um, good question for Glenn, very good question for our because it's something I get asked every day. Uh, so a technical assessment is um, where there might not be a standard solution. We might, we might say, for example, you've got a certain application that we haven't got the uh, test evidence for it, like specifically like that. We can give you primary test evidence and then a fire engineer or a qualified, say, accredited test laboratory can take that information and using scientific approaches and, you know, defined guidelines, extend that scope of application so they can use, for example, actually a primary example, where we talked about the ad hoc testing, our plastable sealing data, that could be used in conjunction with some scientific understanding and extend the scope of application to meet the application on site. The guidelines that we uh, should follow, and again, this is why um, technical assessments are very complex. When I'm getting asked, can you do an EJ technical assessment? It's not a simple thing to do. There is a set of rules. Um, it's been uh, put together, I believe it's EN 15725, if I remember off the top of my head. So if I'm wrong, please mention in the comments, uh, but I apologize uh, if it is, but I believe it's the EN 15725. And these are the guidelines to uh, extend the scope of application. It's put together by the BFPF, which is, I believe the Passive Fire Protection Forum. Um, and there's a big group, which is the UK uh, Fire Safety Group, and these are all the accredited test labs. They get together and set these guidelines, mm -hmm. and that's what you should follow. There is a document, I can share it if you don't have a copy, so please email me at technical. Um, and if that's not followed, then to be honest, your uh, technical assessment or engineer judgment, it's not worth the paper it's written on because it has to follow those strict guidelines. And that's basically what it is. Sounds good. Yeah, bang on. Um, so 100% all round on the on the three questions yeah. for each of us. Um, so yeah, just on continuing on for the technical assessments, um, there is a need for them in the industry. It's not possible to test every type of scenario no. we'd like to, but it is physically not possible. Um, so, but however, they should only be used where appropriate, um, and they must be based on um, suitable and sufficient fire test evidence. Um, so we do have some extended scope of, of application technical assessments. Um, they ha they've been carried out by accredited third party test labs. Um, we try not to conduct a manufacturer assessment um, where, wherever possible, although we do have a very comprehensive knowledge um, of our products. We believe assessments should be carried out um, impartially and independently to avoid any possibility of a conflict of interest. Um, and a manufacturer's judgment should be limited to use on a single name product project. Yeah, um, definitely. So yeah. Well, uh, that brings us to uh, the end of this episode, uh, the very first one of burning questions. So I hope you enjoyed. Uh, the score um, is a tie at the moment, three for three, uh, which is good. Um, so hopefully in the next episode, it can differ or we get a bit more challenging questions. Um, but yeah, that was the first one. Yeah, good, yeah. So um, our marketing team would like um, suggestions and, and feedback so any questions or anything um, email marketing at qualifier.co.uk they'll be glad to hear from you um, make sure you're following us on all of the social media sites um, I think that's it from me yeah um, like I said uh, the contact details will appear on the screen but for the first few episodes we've got some questions that we were going to challenge each other for but yeah like Glenn said questions you want asked you know you want us to discuss send them through and we'll be happy to uh, try and include them in a future episode. Uh, so from me, uh, from Glenn, thank you very much. Thank Until you. next time, take care.